Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. My name is Laura Winnie. I'm the curator of education over at Heritage Village. Welcome to Speaking of History. <laughs> and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jeff Klinkenberg. <laughs> Mr. Klinkenberg spent what he called a lifetime at the Tampa Bay Times as a writer and journalist and recently won the Lifetime Achievement for Writing Award from the Florida Humanities Council. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you, Mr. Klinkenberg. Thank you very much. So this is a talk I haven't done that much, but I'm kind of, it's, it's, it's fun to do it. It's Florida Man, that's, being, that's me and probably some of you versus the stereotype that has uh, developed over the last 20 years. The fake Florida man is what people think of as real. So anyway, I'm going to talk about that because I'm sort of, you know, it really irritates the hell out of me. That, <laughs> you know, people should be reading my books. They shouldn't be looking at fake Florida man. So anyway, so I am a Florida man. Uh, I wasn't born here, but my parents moved to Miami in 1951 when I was two. My dad was a piano player. We lived in different places, including Madeira Beach, but Key West, mostly Miami. So there I am in South Florida, uh, a budding Florida man. Uh, that's my dad. That was Key West in 1954. This is how I got my foot into Florida, was by catching Snapper in the Keys. Uh, he, he would have these, uh, he would have his, his piano playing was at night to the middle of the, you know, 3 a.m. and then he'd sleep late and then in the morning, or actually about 11 o'clock when he woke up, we would go fishing. So that's how, that's, that, was, that was how I got sort of uh, imprinted on Florida. It was through fish and that, that went to other things, sort of get, get, getting interested in birds and some plants, especially snakes. By the way, let me show you what I brought. No, I won't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, I kind of outgrew that, though. When you know, when I was a teenager, I was I told a joke that I was the founder of the the Boys Without Dates Club. So <laughs> it wasn't bad enough that my hands smelled a little bit of like fish because I caught fish. It was it was the knowledge that some some teenage girls had that this guy and his friends. They also like to go and catch snakes, so that was like the the, the uh, deadly combination. <clears throat> um, incidentally, my wife Susan was was at one of my talks one time, and I talked about being a, a member of the Boys Without Dates, and she said, "Don't, don't say you're a boy without a date. It makes me look hard up." So, <laughs> So that's my father-in-law back there, Frank King. Now, Frank, I know you're going to be tempted to make that phone call when you get home, but I, I know you want to marry. Come on, loose lips, you know. So anyway, uh, so I, became, I was a Florida, Florida man early. <clears throat> Look at that's a, that's me. That's with a that's a largemouth bass in the Everglades. Here, I'll, do you mind if I look at this for about ten minutes? No, no I do not do that. <clears throat> um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't help myself showing up. Frank, don't tell Susan about that either. Uh, me with an alligator smoking. It's, it's just another Florida stereotype cliche. <clears throat> but I'm going to talk about Florida man. And this phenomenon started, I don't know, uh, a couple decades ago um, with I think, it, you know, there were some novels. And by the way, I'm a huge fan of Carl Hyacin, who in 1986 wrote a, a novel called Tourist Season. It was a satire. He's a brilliant satirist. 
and he sort of kind of used some of the Florida man things uh, in a brilliant way, not like the kind of the crude stuff that we, we see now. So Carl's a friend of mine. I'm going to talk about Carl a little bit later. Uh, but in, in the late 80s, I sort of hear about uh, Florida's kind of a weird place. <clears throat> and one of the things that happened was, of course, the social media. And in Florida, um, there's a, what we call a sunshine law, which means that uh, our governments can't keep anything secret. So if, uh, uh, if a police reporter from any newspaper goes into the police station, um, they can't decide what a reporter can see and, or, or what, what he, he or she can't see. <clears throat> so sometimes the reporter in a weak moment or if there's nothing uh, more interesting happening will go with some kind of tabloid crime and they're very popular with readers, those kinds of things. And if you look at Facebook or uh, Twitter, what you'll see that when, if a newspaper publishes that story, often online, it ends up on Facebook. And then you look at all the comments and you, see, you, you read only in Florida, even if those things happen other places. <clears throat> so this, this guy, is, he calls himself Florida Man. And his special, I don't know who he is, but his specialty are kind of these, uh, these gross tabloid stories. Now, there's some things we deserve. Uh, in 2000, you know, during the election, I mean, we did have the hanging shads. Uh, and the, uh, who became president was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. But it went on for weeks and weeks. And it happened, something similar happened in, in uh, 2018 with some voter discrepancies. Of course, they happened all over the country. But Florida kind of got the tab. So the, those hanging sheds are killing me. <coughs> There's a picture from 2000. Anybody recognize themselves? Is, is, are, is this person here? I'd like to talk to you. <coughs> so George Bush became the president because of that. So there's fake Florida men and there's fake Florida women. So I'm always looking for those. Uh, I see them on, on Facebook, I see them on t Twitter, I see them on online newspapers in Florida. We get tabbed for all of that stuff. So um, this story tells how it happened, and I've already mentioned to you that we have that sunshine law. Uh, so a lot of those things uh, are easily accessed. Uh, but the New York Times has, has even written about this phenomenon, the Florida man. <clears throat> oh, that's what he look. That's what he pretends to look like. I don't know if that's true. So he kind of lives down to the stereotype, Florida man. Are you here by any chance? Is Florida man here? Okay. So this is the kind of stuff that'll end up on Florida man. Uh, the Florida man site. And they're usually crimes. There's usually crimes. Usually it, it, they involve uh, drinking, um, drugs, alcohol, homelessness. And a lot of those are the, those are people who are pretty, you know, it's kind of like pulling wings off of flies to make fun of them. But that's sort of the, that's what Florida man uh, and some of those other things uh, traffic in. This guy, he was a, uh, he was a, a homeless uh, alcoholic, and he got arrested for something, and it ended up, you know. And sometimes uh, people, the, the people who do these pages and stuff make things up. There was one last week I saw on Facebook, and the guy who had that page uh, called himself The Real Florida. And he put a photograph of this guy lying in the sun, and he had, he had uh, used Photoshop to put a gull in his lap and claim that this guy had fallen asleep on the beach and this gull had helped itself to sensitive areas. <coughs> well, the minute I saw it, I knew it was bull. So I went on his page and said, this is, this is bull hockey. And he came back and said, this is my page. Understand? 
And I said, yes, I understand this isn't true, you know. So anyway, um, we have, the thing about Florida is, first of all, we have 21 million people. We have a lot of people. Um, we, have a, we have a great div diversity. We have all kinds of people. We have all kinds of religions, uh, races, creeds, etc., with folk, way, uh, folk cultures. And so in South Florida, this is a popular uh, Florida man thing. I'm, I mean, you have uh, cultures from uh, Haiti who, who, who live down there who practice religion, uh, kind of using sacrificing animals. So that's become, this is what goes on. And when you, when you leave tonight, look for this. I'm sure you're going to run into this. <coughs> um, so here's a typical one. Uh, so a Florida woman kicks cop in groin, offers to kiss the boo-boo. <coughs> I doubt it, but anyway, it, 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 it made it as a... <coughs> so this is a great one. This happened, uh, this happened about a month ago, and I jumped on it. Um, this really happened. It happened at a Red Lobster, I think. Is there one by Tyrone? Is there one over there? <coughs> so that's what happened. And so uh, the story was there's a homeless uh, woman who has had too much to drink and she's a little bit loud in the restaurant. So they kicked her out and on the way out, she reached into the tank and grabbed the lobster. So the Tampa Bay Times, this Tampa Bay Times put this online like it was, ah, you know, this is what happens in Florida. So I saw it there. Well, I was a newspaper reporter for 50 years, and so I don't take anything for granted, uh, even something that's written by my old newspaper, the Tampa Bay Times. So uh, we have a thing called Google. Any of you heard of it? It's online. So that I saw that, and I, in the search part, I put um, lobster theft. Um, red Lobster. And sure enough, this happens all over the country. <coughs> this happened in August in Macon, Georgia. And then there was another one in Maryland, all in the last couple months. The same identical crime, usually people who've had a little too much to drink, they've had a dispute. And, you know, um, when I saw it, I thought, well, the, the, you know, the story isn't the lobster theft, it's the lack of security at Red Lobster. Wouldn't you think they'd put something over their tanks? <clears throat> but this is, a, this is a Florida story now. This will stick with Florida. This is the kind of thing that happens in Florida uh, every day. Now, I know some of you are going to go to Red Lobster after, we, after we, this talk is over and see what you can get away with. But please don't. Please don't make me come after you. This was, another, this was another one that uh, appeared about a month ago. I know this restaurant, it's called The Chataway. It's down that far from, <coughs> from, uh, from where I live. And it's, uh, so this guy rides his bike. It's like the middle of the night. He rides to The Chataway, gets in, and takes his clothes off. Of course, you know, he, wanted to, he wanted to be comfortable as he ate his, his, his Raymond and noodles. You know, you don't want to be feel encumbered by clothes. So he was, so he was naked and there's security cameras. So they caught him and then he left still naked, got on a bicycle and, and pedaled into the night. But so, so this became this great story that naked people in restaurants, that's, it just happens like every, every day, five, six times in Florida. <clears throat> so again, it doesn't take a whole lot if you have Google, you don't have to accept this stuff. So uh, this was a naked man found doing jumping jacks at McDonald's. This was in Georgia, you know. I wouldn't have wanted to watch that. <coughs> but, you know, all, write, just write naked man in Google and see what comes up. You'll be entertained for hours. Uh, this was in Alaska. And you'd think, you know, I hope that plane, I hope they had the, the heat on but uh, naked man runs down aisle of Alaskan Airlines flight, passengers say. So anybody from Alaska by any chance? I, did, did you get cold? No, just kidding. <clears throat> so 
Um, so often when, you know, uh, when I read a, about some tabloid Florida crime, I just, I'll just write down, I'll go to Google and I'll write weird, and I'll just put in a state. So this one was North Dakota. And uh, this was a naked man who, you know, I don't know if he'd had too much to drink and, and forgot where he lived, but anyway, he invaded a house and he got booked into jail in North Dakota. You know, that's not exactly like Miami Beach, you know, I, I don't think. <clears throat> um, incidentally, if you go to Amazon and you put in weird, uh, what you'll find is there are books like this from almost every state in the country. It's not just Florida. It's not just, oh, Florida, the Craig Pittman thing. It's all, it's all over the place. Um, so here's weird New Jersey, you know. Yeah. <laughs> You're the authors, I understand now. Okay. <clears throat> um, so this was one. This North Dakota, come on. What, you know, don't try to steal our thunder. This was a woman stabbed in cheek with her own high heel. You know, you wonder what the physics of that, you know, how does that happen? But anyway. Uh, this, South Dakota, this is one of my favorites of all time. So imagine you're, you're a mom. You've worked hard all day. You've gone to bed. Your, your infant is in another room asleep. And something wakes you up. You hear a noise and it's frightening and you get up and you want to check on your baby. So you go into that room and find a stranger breastfeeding your child. <laughs> uh, again, somebody who'd had a little too much to drink. And, and unfortunately, uh, uh, people have too much to drink everywhere. It's not just, it's just not Florida. Anybody recognize this guy? This is the guy who from Fort Lauderdale who, uh, who'd, been, uh, who'd been reading some uh, right-wing hate uh, websites and, uh, and, in, and heard the president attack members of the media. So he sent bombs out to a lot of people all over the country. <clears throat> so this got a lot of Facebook uh, traffic. And sure enough, uh, I started seeing under his picture only in Florida. Well, this guy was from Fort Lauderdale. This was only in Florida. And I thought, wait a minute. Wasn't Kevin McVeigh the Oklahoma bomber from Kansas? You know? And wasn't the uh, uh, Unabomber from Montana? So it was a sad thing, but it didn't happen. It just it, it, uh, happens in every place. Um, I like this one. This one, this one is a real Florida story. There are Florida stories that are are legitimate, and this one, uh, and I'll read it because I know some of you in the back can't can't see it, but it says, "Assault with a deadly weapon, Florida man charged with throwing alligator into Wendy's." So this was some young kid. I think he, uh, some uh, uh, adult beverages were involved, but he just thought it'd be funny to come in there with a small alligator and, and throw it out there. Uh, by the way, that's my alligator hat. I put that in the. <clears throat> now, here's a real Florida story. And it's actually, it's, uh, this happened down in South Florida. And for, for a, a good Florida story, in my opinion, should have certain elements. This one had them all. Um, so this happened on the Miccosukee Indian Reservation. The Miccosukees, like the Seminoles, are uh, natives who came into Florida in the 1700s. Uh, all the, our native Flor Flor Florida Indians were gone. Uh, and so you had, you had Indians coming into Florida from Alabama and Georgia. And later they became known as Seminoles. And then the Miccosukees broke off from the Seminoles. And so we're talking about uh, folks of Miccosukees or folks who've been in Florida since the 1700s. They're known mostly as the Everglades Indians. So if you drive across uh, Tamani Trail, you see those the cheeky huts. Those are Miccosukees. <clears throat> and if you're on the Miccosukee Reservation, so Miccosukees, I mean, you can't get more Florida than that, in my opinion. If you grow, drive across the trail, as you get close to Miami, you'll see this 
It's, it looks like the Empire State Building. It's not. It's a bingo palace. <laughs> uh, the Mikasukis run it. It's huge. You see it for, for 10 miles away. You can see it, you know, standing up in the sawgrass. Um, and um, gambling has seen uh, these, uh, these bingo parlors and stuff, gambling. It's very popular in Florida. It is part of Florida culture. I may not go there, but it's part of Florida culture. So we've got the Mikasukis and the gambling in one place. Um, there's also, uh, it, uh, I don't know if uh, there's, uh, yeah, Florida does have crime, no doubt about it. And uh, the night that this happened, uh, November 14th, 2007, um, the parking lot was jammed. It's a huge parking lot. It's like, a, it's like if you went to a stadium. Hundreds, if not a couple thousands of cars. And a lot of people will go through the parking lot and they'll break into cars. So that was happening that night. And some security guards saw this guy breaking into a car and blew his whistle. And this guy took off and they chased him. And he came to a fence and he climbed over the fence and he tried to get away, uh, swimming across a pond where he was taken and killed by an alligator. So <clears throat> that's not exactly a funny ending to that story, but it's like it's so perfectly Florida to me when you have all those elements. So that if, if something like that shows up, <clears throat> I don't object. Because it's that really happened, and I sent that to Carl Heisen, you know, uh, you know. So I, I'm hoping, if it hasn't been in the book, it will be. Um, but anyway, so a lot of real Florida stories, uh, you have these elements, because uh, what makes Florida unique, it's uh, it's critters, it's temperature, uh, it's all these cultures, it's the heat. So sometimes when when those things all intersect, you have a real Florida story. And I guess that naked guy in the restaurant, maybe he was a little hot, you know, that night <laughs> and he wanted to cool off. <clears throat> um, one of the problems with that, though, with, with, the, with, the, with Florida Man, to me, is it distracts from some of the real problems we have in Florida. Uh, 21 million people, um, infrastructure is a little bit weak. Um, we have now um, global warming is is here, but it's not quite like the uh, the Red Sea coming down uh, on top of the Egyptians. But it's here uh, in in South Florida. The the ocean is coming through the drains on Miami Beach when the tide is full. Here, when we have those full moon tides in St. Pete, because I've I've lived here for 40 years, I see the tide higher than I've ever seen it, and uh, I see plants now in Pinellas County that 20 years ago you would have seen south of Tampa Bay. So we're getting tropical plants there. <coughs> so we have invasive animals now, reptiles. Uh, they're mostly in South Florida, but they're coming. They will be here eventually. But I thought I would tell you this is my favorite python story. Um, I know all these guys. Um, so here's the situation, and this happened in, in I want to say about 1990, long before pythons were the poster boys for invasive animals. So imagine you're an elderly person, you're living in a house in Fort Lauderdale, you're next to a state park, uh, you and your wife are watching television one Friday night, it's raining, and suddenly you hear this piercing scream from the backyard. Well, part of you wants to just call the police, but you're, you know, you're still self-reliant. So you get a flashlight and you walk into the backyard in the rain. Took some guts. <clears throat> so you, know, you don't see a woman screaming. You see a raccoon screaming because it's being suffocated by this giant snake under a mango tree. And as depressing as that is, even more depressing is the moment when you watch the python slither under your house. It's living under your house. <clears throat> so this guy, for a couple weeks, he kept calling. He called the police. He called the Wildlife Commission. 
Nobody believed him back then. They would now, but nobody believed him. And finally, he caught the guy, uh, the sec- guy in the blue shirt, second from the right. His name is Todd Hardwick. He's got a business in South Florida called Pesky Critters. He's a very colorful guy. I've known him for many years. He's the guy you would call, typically, if you had a possum in your attic. Uh, but this old guy called him and Todd went over to his house and brought these uh, three other guys. The guy on the right is a good friend of mine. His name is Joe Wasilewski. <clears throat> he's a herpetologist. He's a college trained. He's a, he's a reptile and amphibian guy. And he lives down in Homestead. Uh, he is famous for an American crocodile study he did down there. Uh, he's famous for almost dying from a rattlesnake bite a couple of years ago, which I wrote about in my, my new book, which is called Son of Real Florida. And he's famous now for, he's working for the federal government. He's catching pythons in the Everglades. So he's a real python guy. That's why he's got the head. So anyway, so these guys come and, you know, here's this ordinary house. It's a working class neighborhood. And they crawl under the house, the four of them. And the, it wasn't like a completely open crawl space. The walls of the, of, the, of the rooms went down all the way to the ground. But the snake had, there were these like giant mouse holes. These, the snake had like dug underneath these. So they, they went in there. They, these, these holes are big enough to allow men to go through there. And finally they determined that, uh, and there were like bones and stuff, and there was that snake funk that uh, I remember from when I was a boy without a date, you know. <laughs> so they, they, decide, they decided that this snake is under the corner bedroom. So they'd go out and they left one guy under the house with a garbage can lid to block one of those holes so the snake couldn't escape. So now they go outside and uh, Todd is very, uh, he's very media um, savvy, so he called all the newspapers and the TV stations. So they all come. <clears throat> uh, and he hasn't even seen the snake yet. He's just, he's just, he, but he smelled it. He's seen like some pretty big bones down there. So, um, so he and his friends, they dig a hole next to that corner bedroom and then underneath the house. And Todd went in feet first. Uh, the other big guys are holding his feet and Todd had a, uh, it's a noose pole. It's a pole with a wire noose that is, you, can, you can catch a snake that way. So Todd is down there. <clears throat> He's got a light. And he says, okay, she's here. She's upset. She's going around the room. And one of the times she went underneath him, he got her and pulled the noose tight around her, her neck. And she came right at him. Uh, he screamed. They pulled him into the yard with the snake. And uh, he told me that uh, all of South Florida's uh, media went running. Nobody got that. <laughs> Nobody got the money shot. They got this one later. <clears throat> so um, this is a reticulated python. This is the longest snake on earth. They, they can get to be almost 30 feet. The anaconda which are also in South Florida, are heavier, but they're not as big as this. The, 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 big, the, the python problem in Florida is mostly Burmese pythons from Asia and rock pythons from Africa. They're dangerous. They're not venomous, but they bite. In fact, Joe, um, one time, I, you know, because I know he catches pythons, I said, Joe, what's it like to be bitten by a python? He said, well, it's not fun. And this is a guy, of course, who was bitten by a rattlesnake in 2013 and needed 47 vials of antivenin. He almost died. So I said, well, what do you do? What happens when a python, uh, a big one, bites you? And, and, and you probably know this, but their, their lower jaw is unhinged so they can, they can swallow big prey. And they have teeth that are like this. They, they kind of go inward. They're meant for holding. So Joe said, when one gets you, you're in a vice. And he said, you can't do this, which is what I would do, because it would, it would you know, destroy, destroy your skin, your nerves, your muscle. 
He said, you just have to stand there and wait until it lets you go. But anyway, <clears throat> so this was 21 feet long. It was over 200 pounds and it was living in a house, living under a house in South Florida. Um, Todd uh, took it on The Tonight Show, Johnny Carson, and then he ended up selling it to the Memphis Zoo. And I think it died a couple years ago. He called it Big Mama. So about a week after this happened, I called him up and I said, hey, you know, I introduced myself. I said, can I come down and spend some time with you? And of course, he loved that, you know. So I did. And the first day, uh, I think he caught, he, it was like a routine get day. He got a possum from somebody's attic and maybe, a, I, mean, I think he got a raccoon. It wasn't a big deal. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't very exciting though. I knew I was going to tell this story, <clears throat> but um, I was going to leave the next day. And he called me about 6 a.m. and said, hey, uh, I just got a report uh, from Little Haiti. That's a neighborhood in North Miami where there's a lot of Haitians living there that, uh, there's a python underneath an abandoned mattress in somebody's backyard. The cops are on the way. And he said, meet me there. So I did. I drove down there. So I arrive and there's this abandoned mattress in a the backyard. There's cops with guns. There's neighborhood people with machetes. And Todd, by the way, he's like five, six. And he usually wears this cowboy hat about this big and these boots. And he, he had told me, uh, the only difference between me and John Wayne is John Wayne is dead. <laughs> He's a cocky guy. <clears throat> so he knelt down and he stuck his hands under the mattress. And he said, okay, she's here. I'm going to pull her out. No shooting, no machetes. And he pulled her out and she was 14 feet long. And it turned out um, she was somebody's pet. She, she um, belonged to a drug dealer. Somebody was somebody in the neighborhood had this giant aquarium with that snake in there and the drugs were in there too. And someone had found out and broken in and broken the glass so the so and left the python out so he could get the drugs. So anyway, and the guy showed up. He said, Hey, you got my python. And t Todd, you know, like I say, he's John Wayne. He said, he said, it's not yours now, it's mine, you know, and the guy said, whoa, okay, you know. <clears throat> so, um, so we're there and Todd carry, he has these big laundry bags. So he puts this thing in a laundry bag, cinches it up and there was a McDonald's a couple blocks away. And he, sa he said, let's, you know, I haven't had anything for breakfast. I hadn't either. So I got in his truck with him. So he's driving, I'm on the passenger side. And this snake is in this bag between us. <coughs> so we go to, we go to the, you know, we go drive through. So you order, you know, you order, you shout into the speaker. And then we went to collect our, our, uh, whatever they were, McMuffins or whatever, egg McMuffins. And this woman is handing us our, our, our food and she looks over and here's this bag next to us moving. And I, she probably thought we had like kidnapped the child. And Todd said, no, nope, no, nope, it's just a big snake. You want to see it? Oh, no. But anyway. So anyway, we really have with the, the, the there's some estimates like 200,000 uh, pythons in South Florida um, and probably more iguanas and there's monitor lizards and there's things all the time that are showing up. They're most, mostly, you know, they were, at one time they were people's pets and they let them go and the, the horse is out of the barn. And so the federal government has programs to try to eradicate them, but it's really hard at this point. And these snakes are hard to find when they're in the wild. You have to get them usually when it's cold and they'll come out. And when I've seen pythons in the Everglades, it's been on cold mornings when they come up on roads. <clears throat> but anyway, um, and they're invasives. They have no natural enemies really. And down there, they're eating deer. They're eating rabbits. They're going through the food chain, and it's a scary thing. And especially when you when you put uh, uh, a warming climate uh, on the, um, you add a warming climate to that problem. And um, you know, we're, we're we've 
we've got a pretty severe iguana problem now just on the other side of the bay. And a couple of friends of mine have said they've seen them on the beach in Pinellas County. Those are probably escapees, but you don't want them to reproduce because, first of all, they'll damage every plant in your yard. They'll get in your attic to, uh, to get warm. They'll eat their way through the air conditioning. Uh, um, yeah. So anyway, it's a bad thing. Um, we also have problems that uh, we re read about them in the paper, but a lot of people, they're science. You know, a lot of people would rather read about the naked man in the Chattaway. <clears throat> so that's Lake Okeechobee. This was last summer. That's what it looked like. Um, and this is red tide. I don't know if you can see it, but a lot of dead, uh, dead fish on the beach. Um, so these are, these are problems. Um, traffic, we already know about that this time of year. Um, I just, I drove back from North Carolina yesterday and I drove through Atlanta and Atlanta can be bad, but I drove through Atlanta yesterday without having to, to stop and, and stop and go traffic. However, in North Tampa on a Saturday afternoon, I had to stop. You know, the, the traffic just crept for about 10 miles. Um, and that's Florida, you know, and, and if, or, or God help you if you have to go to, through Orlando. Parts of Miami are just awful. Um, and we don't want to spend any money to fix things up. Uh, and our schools are, you know, our, our public schools. My uh, friends of mine did this uh, series uh, and won a Pulitzer Prize a couple of years ago where, you know, these, these kids don't have a chance. So anyway, I've sort of, I'm, 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 I'm going to try to be quick the rest of this program, but because I want to talk about some, some real Florida men and Florida women that are admirable, who kind of get lost in the shuffle with Florida men. <clears throat> um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. I grew up in Miami. Everybody knew who she was. I'd never met her. Uh, for some of you who don't know uh, anything about her, she was born in 1890. Uh, in New England. She moved to Miami in 1915 after a divorce to work for her daddy's newspaper, the Miami Herald. Her dad said, okay, I'm going to put you on the women's pages. She said, father, I don't want to write about women's topics. I can write about anything. Uh, so she did, and she was really good. She could cover the cops. She could cover anything, and she started writing nonfiction and fiction. So in 1941, 42, she got a call from a, from a publisher who said, I'm putting together these series of books. I'm calling them the Rivers of America. And I assign a prominent author at one river, and you just write about it. Not only the natural history, but human history, you know, the culture, the whole thing. And he said, I'd like you to write about the Miami River. And she said, the Miami River, it's an inch long. How about I write about the Everglades? And she said, the Ever, he said, the Everglades, the Everglades isn't a river. Uh, and, he, and she said, well, it is a river. It's 50 miles wide and six inches deep, but it flows from, from Orlando down to Florida Bay. It's a river. So that book was published in, um, in 1947, uh, the year that Everglades National Park opened. Uh, that's her signing at Burdines, which is no more. It was the Florida store. Uh, she was 58 years old when this published. Uh, but it really helped put the Everglades on the map. It's an elegantly written history. It's not a book you read while you have Seinfeld on in the background with, with a bowl of cheese doodles in front of you. It's a, it's a reading book. <clears throat> and it's the only one of the rivers of America that's still in print. So I grew up hearing about her. So I wasn't even born when this came out. I was born the next year. Um, so she's 58. I mean, you know, 58 back then at least, you know, a lot of people were slowing down, thinking about retirement. And, you know, she wanted to do gardening and all that kind of stuff. And in 1968, so we're talking about 20 years later, so she's in her late 70s. Um, 
someone got this idea to build an international airport out in the middle of the Everglades. And she knew enough about the Everglades and how it's the, you know, the, it's where the water supply comes from <clears throat> that it wasn't going to be a good thing. And so she started an organization called the Friends of the Everglades uh, that still exists to this day. And it stopped the international, it's called the Jet Port. Richard Nixon signed the, the, the papers to close the airport down or, or to not let it get off the ground. So that was Marjorie. So now she's, she's in her late 70s. <clears throat> well, in 1990, she turned 100 years old living down in the Miami area. And just about then, um, I worked up my nerve to get to call and see if I could come and interview her. And my idea was I was going to do a series of essays about the Everglades. They were going to be, they were, I was going to be in them. They were going to be, they were going to be, but they were going to be reported. I was going to go down uh, and write 12 essays um, based on people, the place, the issues, work, working my way down from Orlando, which is where that's the headquarters of the Everglades, all the way to Florida Bay. And I decided, you know, what I should do is I should start with her. I'm going to start with her because she is, she's sort of the mother of the Everglades. So I called her, I, I, I sent her a, a postcard. And I'd, I'd, uh, before then, I'd exchanged a couple of letters with her, and she always answered. So I sent her a postcard, and she sent a postcard back to her secretary, please come on down. So I think it was, it was early 1992 when I actually went down there. And living in this little bungalow in Coconut Grove, which is a suburb of, of Coral Gables, surrounded by these trophy three-story houses. Um, and she'd lived there since 1926. And I went to the door and I knocked on it. And she came and she opened the door. She's 102 years old. She was about this tall, had pearls. She always wore pearls. She had pearls and, uh, and a bathrobe and let me in. And we sat down and I thought, you know, she's 102. I'm only going to be there for about an hour. <coughs> um, but I ended up there for about five hours with her. And it would, she spoke in perfect paragraphs. She was extremely articulate about everything, not just about the Everglades, but all kinds of things. Uh, very curious about my life. I mean, she wasn't one of these, it wasn't just about her. She had curiosity about other people and other people's lives. An amazing place. She had no stove. She had never learned how to cook. Uh, someone had brought in a, uh, a microwave but she didn't know how to use that. It was just, you know, she was 102 years old and she was an icon and people would come and, and you know, prepare, warm her food and stuff. She had never learned how to drive a car, so she didn't have a car. So she always assumed if I need to get some, go somewhere, someone will take me. Uh, she had only recently gotten an air conditioner. <coughs> she had first, she had, uh, she had a collection of Dickens books, first edition. She had an amazing library. Um, she could hardly hear, and she had uh, uh, macular degeneration. She wore these thick glasses, so she was virtually blind. And when I got there, she had a she had she had a helper, an aide, and I would I would ask her a question, and she would shout. He the the aide would shout in her ear, um, kind of like that that uh, Garrett Morris thing on Saturday Night Live. You remember him? He did the, the news for the hard of hearing, he would just shout it out. After a while, I was shouting at him. I didn't need to do that, but I was shouting at him. <clears throat> so we had this, we're having this great talk, and at this one point, I decide, well, I'm an Everglades boy, too. I mean, I'm a founder of the Boys Without Dates. I'm going to tell her something about the Everglades. I'm going to brag to her about what happened just a couple months ago when I was in on a Florida panther capture down in southwest Florida. I'm going to tell her what that was like. So I start to tell her. And they're, they're catching panthers, the, the, the biologists are, and they're putting radio collars on them. And then they release them. And then the idea is they can figure out how, how panthers are moving through south Florida. Because they didn't know anything. Um, 
there were only 10 or 15 panthers left on Earth now. There's quite a few more now. But, um, so it was like basic science. So I'm, t I'm telling her about the, the capturing and this is why they were doing it. And she said, wow, that sounds to me like the utmost cruelty you know, in this imperious way. And I said, well, Mrs. Douglas, this is why they're doing it, blah, 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 blah. She said, my cat Willie doesn't even like a flea collar. And I looked, <laughs> she, had like, she had cat doors all over her house. I'm thinking, oh no, I'm with a cat woman, you know. <laughs> So I tried one more time, and she said, Lord have mercy, like she was with the world's biggest idiot. You know? So we ended up talking just about the Dickens stuff. <clears throat> so I like to talk, to talk about her now, especially because of the, the massacre that happened at, uh, in South Florida last year uh, at a school that bears her name. Uh, obviously, the, the focus was on those students and teachers who were murdered. It wasn't necessarily about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. But, uh, you know, I, I wrote something uh, that was, I have a lot of Facebook friends, so it went on Facebook and a lot of people saw it and then I got a call from the, uh, from the Washington Post that had decided, just about two weeks after the tragedy, that they were going to they were going to do a story on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, so I was part of, part of that. Uh, a lot of people, you know, had told me, God, she's spin in her grave at this, and she certainly would be upset. But, you know, uh, as I thought of it, though, I thought, you know what? She would have been uh, thrilled with those young students who were willing to fight the powers that be. They were young and idealistic and didn't know uh, and excuse me for getting political, that gun manufacturers run our country. <clears throat> she was used to fighting these, these fights. I mean, you know, the, the, you know the, the Everglades is still, I mean, we're still fighting about the Everglades. And if she were here, she'd still be fighting about the Everglades. She died when she was 108 years old. Um, I kept in touch with her after that interview for at least three years. And she would always write back. She was a 21st, a 19th century woman. She wrote letters. But anyway, Mrs. Douglas. Um, so this was the, the, a story I wrote right before I retired. It came out in, I think, 2014. A lot of people say this is the best profile of anybody I ever wrote about. <clears throat> I got a call from somebody, a teacher in Pinellas County said, hey, I just bought some property in the woods of Gilchrist County, that's west of Gainesville. And um, I, was, I was walking through the woods one day and I met this barefoot guy, this old guy, and he knew, knew more about the woods than anyone I'd ever met. And he seemed to have every possible skill. And you ought to try to call him up and, and write about him. So I did for about a year and couldn't reach him. He did have a phone. When I called him at 5 a.m. one morning and got him at home. And he said, Jeff, I've heard about you. Yeah, you can come up here. And so I did with uh, a photographer. And he was living in this, this shack that his daddy had lived in and his granddaddy had lived in. No running water. Pee outside. Had what? But he did have. He had one electric. He had one light bulb in the house, <clears throat> and um, you know, initially when I went up there, I thought I was just going to write about this 21st century guy who didn't like to wear shoes. And the more we spoke, uh, the more the depths of him just sort of unfolded. And I ended up going there four or five times in a month to write about him. Um, so the first time I'm in there, and he had a wood-burning stove that he cooked on, but uh, he hadn't cooked in a few hours, so it was cool, and he had a book on there, on, on the stove. It was the, the Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant, uh, which is considered literature. Grant was a great writer, and uh, late in his life, dying of cancer, trying to make some money so his wife would have some money, he wrote this memoir, still in print, still beloved to this day. And he was reading it. And that was another book you don't read. It's not a casual read. It's, you know, 19th century prose. And we started talking about the Civil War, and he was a Civil War buff. 
he knew so much more than I did, especially Florida. And he, he noticed my that I looked a little uncomfortable, a little embarrassed. So he said, well, let's talk about World War II. You might know more about that than I did. <laughs> so uh, one day, one of my visits, I stopped in Bell, 10 miles away, the nearest town. Bought him, uh, bought us both some coffee from McDonald's. Gave it to him. Wow, that's right good coffee. He'd never been to a McDonald's. He'd never been to Miami. He'd never been to Orlando. <clears throat> um, and I found out, uh, you know, a friend, I, I talked to a friend and said, you know, he's read his way through the Gilchrist County Library, an eighth grade dropout. So I asked Nathan about that and he said, he said, Jeff, that isn't true. I don't read, I don't read about, I don't read space stories or love stories. So he didn't read romance fiction or science fiction. <laughs> but he read everything else. <clears throat> so, Nathan could hunt. He could fish. He knew how to trap. He could slaughter a hog. He could do plumbing. He could do electrical work. He could build a house. He had money. He had worked for the roads department for 38 years saved his money. And that was another lesson that I got from him. Uh, he was living, he, he was a Thor character out of Thoreau. He was a Thoreauvian character. Thoreau said, simplify, simplify, simplify. I lived in this one room house about this big in Walden, in Massachusetts. <clears throat> and, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a 21st century guy. I'm a modern guy. I like my, I like my TV. I like my phone. I don't want to give up anything, you know. But he had learned that there's a difference between needs and wants, you know. So there are some things he needed, but th there are things he wanted that he just didn't want to buy. Now, he did have two pairs of shoes, one pair that he bought at Walmart 25 years before for like 15 bucks, and another pair he had, uh, he had gotten out of a dumpster, uh, his casual pair. So I'm learning all this stuff about Nathan, right? And so much to my surprise, I found out he'd been married twice. <laughs> the first time when he was 16 years old, he's married. Uh, and after a couple of years ago, she says, Nathan, you're too country. And that was the end of that marriage. And he went a little wild with, with liquor and all that stuff. And that, but he'd given that up. And then he got a call one day um, from a woman that he'd known as a child. And she remembered him as a, being a kind guy and also very handsome. He was a very handsome man. And she said, Nathan, I'm divorced too. Why don't we get together? So he put on his shoes that day <laughs> and met her in town and they had a cup of coffee. And they, when I, I think when I wrote this story, they'd been married 22 years. She had never set foot in his house. She, she sometimes visited his property in the winter when she wouldn't get bug bit, but uh, they had a weekend marriage. She would come. She she lived in this this ranch house uh, about 15 miles away. I would call her a kind of a refined Southern Christian woman. And Nathan would come over there. And in fact, one day I went. Uh, Melissa, my photographer, and I went over there with uh, with Nathan, and Vida prepared us this wonderful dinner. In the South, dinner is lunch, supper is dinner. So we went over there for dinner and it was three or four courses with the most amazing vegetables from Nathan's garden. And I looked at this garden, I couldn't believe it. <clears throat> and um, he told me that he planted by the moon, depending on the phases of the moon, like, these, like his great, great grandfather had done. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a modern guy. I've written a lot of science stories. I'm thinking, no, this, this can't be. But I'm looking at it. And he would plant those crops that grew up like corn and, and bean, beans when the moon was high so the gravitational pull could help pull them out of the ground. And when the moon was new, you know, when you didn't see it on the other side of the, the Earth, 
he planted his root crops like carrots and sweet potatoes and stuff. And I'm thinking, who am I to say this doesn't work? I'm, look, I'm eating it, you know? <clears throat> so you'll notice he's wearing a jacket that's about 30 years old. And when I saw it, it looked like it had been torn apart by wild animals, which in fact it had been. <laughs> he had, like years before, he had tried to free a bobcat kitten from a fence and she scratched him and tore his shirt. And now, uh, but he still loved the shirt, it was comfortable. And there were no buttons, he used uh, safety pins. <laughs> so there he went over to Vada's house and for this dinner that was wonderful. And uh, that's what his feet looked like. They're like possum feet, they're like, po they're like yellow and stuff. <clears throat> So we're, I'm in the house, you know, we're, we're sitting there that we've had this wonderful dinner and Vida and Nathan sit on this couch and they start to fence, you know, like any old married couple. And she says, you know, if you leave your jacket here, I'm going to burn it. <laughs> and he said, oh no, ma'am, you can't burn my jacket. It's so comfortable. And I said, Vida, you know, do Nathan's feet ever kind of drive you crazy? And she says, she says, when they really get bad, I just get my rose clippers. <coughs> and I thought, you know, this this isn't a Hallmark card line. But, it's, <laughs> but anyway, Nathan is in my book, Son of Real Florida. Um, he showed me the family graveyard, you know. He knew where everybody was going to go. Great, great grandfather, great grandfather, his dad, uh, his brother, and there was a space for him. And he's in that space now. He passed away last summer of some kind of blood disorder. And he's buried there without shoes. And I keep in touch with his wife, Vida. She's come to a number of my talks in, in North Central Florida. And she brings all her relatives. She's bought 50 of my books. I, you know, I should hire her as an agent because Nathan is in that book. This is, I'm going to end with this just because I know some of you read Carl Hyacin's novels. Do you not? You know who Carl is, right? <clears throat> he's the great satirist from South Florida. And he's the guy who sort of invented the kind of the, the weird Florida uh, type of thing. So, uh, but to t tell you about Carl, I have to tell you first about Tim. And um, when I was 19 years old, I was the sports editor of the community college newspaper in Miami, Miami Day North. I was the sports editor of the Falcon Times. And one day this guy came in. I'm 5'9". He must have been 6'3", 6'4", but he seemed bigger because he was burly. Uh, he came in wearing camouflage, head to toe. And he got too close to me. He's like looking down. He was just, he was pugnacious. He said, I want to write about hunting and fishing. Like, you know, this hippie boy wasn't was going to say, oh no, we can't do that. We only cover sports that have balls in them, you know. <clears throat> but of course, he didn't know that I was a boy without a date. So I said, well, that sounds great. You you go right ahead. So my joke was, during the age of Aquarius, we were the only college newspaper in the country that had an outdoors editor. That was Tim. <clears throat> so anyway, I ended up at the Tampa Bay Times, the old St. Pete Times, and. Tim ended up at the Miami Herald. He was a photographer. He was an amazing photographer. Uh, and he was known for his macho. Uh, he would go, he would volunteer to go to the worst places on Earth. The earthquake, the Cat 5 hurricane, the war, the war, the revolution. <clears throat> uh, do you remember Jonestown? His boots were the first on the ground there. You've seen his photographs, those terrible photographs of, of these bloated bodies. And he came in a helicopter, he, he, he rappelled down and had a bandana over his mouth and nose so he could uh, repel the smell as much as he could and just look through, the, look through the lens finder the whole time just to keep, stay detached from that horror in front of him. But that's Tim. That's what Tim did. And we've kept in touch. He was I, was, I was a boy without a date. He was like the king of the boys of the day. He really, I didn't know him when we were, uh, when, when we were like 16, but he, 
he was an Everglades boy, the hunting, the fishing, the whole shebang. Uh, so uh, Tim and I, would we met in a couple of stories when we were both writing about the Everglades. I'd, I'd run into them, so we've kept in touch. And about 2007, he, he called me and said, you know, I've been working on this house down in the Keys for 20 years. Um, whenever I could save enough money, I would buy uh, I would buy material, and I did all. I was doing all the work myself, and I almost have it. And my goal is to build a house that can withstand a Category 10 hurricane, <laughs> <clears throat> and that's what I've what I've tried to do. So anyway, there's there's Tim and I, uh, big cigar. That's his trademark. Frank, Susan went with me uh, when when I did this story, and. Uh, he can be a little scary, but he was just charming. Um, <clears throat> this is one of his last days at the Miami Herald, and they would send him. He would he would look for he'd look for a story every day, and then go there and take pictures, and then send the pictures to the office, and then uh, write a long caption, and that was it. So anyway, he retired about when I did in in 2014. We're about the same age, so. He's Carl Hyacinth's best friend. They've had many adventures together. Uh, one of the famous adventures is they were covering a, uh, a civil disturbance in Miami. Uh, Miami. Part of Miami was on fire. Cars were being overturned. People were being killed. And lots of newspaper reporters and photographers were there, including uh, Tim and Carl. Tim, Tim is driving. Carl is sitting next to him. And there's an editor in the back seat. And they're going into these bad areas, and, and as other reporters are, and late uh, in the early evening, it's time to leave. They have enough. And uh, Tim says, all right, well, let's go. And Carl says, thank God. And Tim says, wait a minute. He said, there's a market down the street here that has the greatest cantaloupes I've ever seen. <laughs> and Carl said, are you censored me? You know, I'm, I don't want to say a bad word. <clears throat> and Tim said, "This is my town. If I want to, if I want a cantaloupe, I'm going to get it." So Carl told me that they drove into this area. Tim got out of the car. These crowds, this crowd of angry people, parted like the Red Sea <clears throat> because it was just—he's big, but it was just sort of a shocking. Fearlessly, he went into the market, came out, got in the car. They drove home, and um, so yeah, I decided then, you know. I'm going to write about Tim. He's really an interesting character. The, the career he's had, his background as a boy in the Everglades, his friendship with Carl Hyacin, I'm going to write about Tim. So, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, with Carl uh, talking about Tim. And I got a lot of great stories. And one story is uh, Tim's driving across the Tam Miami Trail, US 41, right? And uh, he sees somebody in front of him, and another car in front of him, veer out of the lane to run over a snake. So Tim stops and scoops up the dead snake and then hits the gas. And about 20 minutes later, catches this guy on the outskirts of Miami. And Tim jumps out of his pickup truck and runs to the window and raps on the window. And the guy unrolls the window, and Tim says, here. Eat it. <laughs> we eat what we kill. <clears throat> so Tim has always been a, uh, a very avid, angry environmentalist, uh, angrier than I am. In fact, when he was uh, when he was like 20, one summer, his dad says, "Tim, I'm going to send you up to your grandmother's in Canada." Why is that? Well, Tim had used a chainsaw to cut to cut down a billboard. On Biscayne Boulevard in Miami that was advertising some development that was going to go up in the mangroves. <clears throat> so anyway, Tim uh, has his dog. Uh, maybe she's gone by now, a, a retriever, which he named Bullet. You know, Tim is a gun guy. Um, Bullet liked to dig under the fence. This is before Tim moved completely to the Keys. Tim was still living in Miami. So Bullet would, would dig a hole and go under the fence and be out in traffic, and Tim was sure this dog was going to be killed. And so uh, 
Tim asked a friend, what should I do? I can't keep Bullard in the, in the yard anymore. He said, well, you need to get a, uh, an electric, uh, you, you need a, one of those uh, shock collars. Put it on Bullet, and when Bullet goes to the fence, give him a shock, and he'll learn not to go to the fence. So he bought the, he bought the, the shock collar and then decided it was cruel. So he put it on himself and shocked himself to see what it was like and knocked him on his butt. And when Carl was writing, uh, I, I think it's, there's a, there's a novel that I've read and I've enjoyed, but it's, uh, it's got Storm in the title. Anybody? He wrote it after Hurricane Andrew. If you've read Carl's novels, there's a character who shows up every other novel. Skink. Skink is the, and, and this is fiction, this is make-believe, but Skink is the former governor of Florida who got so fed up with the corruption and venality in Tallahassee that he fled to the Everglades where he eats roadkill. And he's lost an eye, he's got an eye patch, but he emerges in, in every other novel usually to discipline bad guys. Tim, he's skink. He's the dangerous skink. <laughs> Carl will tell you he's used different people, but, but Tim is the scary skink. Um, because, first of all, he, he, he does eat roadkill. I have to tell you that. <clears throat> and he's, he's scary. I mean, he, I, mean he's, he's, I don't have a friend like him. He, uh, he's the most probably, he would do anything for me. But I would never ask him to for fear of what he might do. <laughs> there he is with an iguana. I will tell you an iguana story in a minute about Tim. So there's a dead iguana and there's a pistol and there's a shadow, kind of like Alfred Hitchcock of somebody smoking a cigar. So now this is Tim. Tim shot an iguana. He does not tolerate invasive animals in Florida. And so he just he texted me this photo one day. And I knew what he was going to have for dinner that night because <laughs> he eats what he kills. But anyway, that's Tim. And, you know, when I, uh, I wrote the story, it was in the Tampa Bay Times. It's in a book called Alligators in B-Flat, the story I did. And, uh, and about a year later, Tim uh, retired and the Herald had pages and pages devoted to Tim's work. And Museum of Florida History had an exhibit of Tim's stuff. So all these... Uh, these Tim stories emerged that I didn't have. I felt bad about it, but I got a, uh, an email from this, uh, this woman reporter from, uh, from Reuters who told me this great Tim story. So there's a revolution in Haiti in the late 80s. Uh, Papa Doc, uh, there was an uprising. So a lot of reporters are down there, and including Tim. And this reporter from Reuters who wasn't working with Tim, she knew Tim, but they just happened to be down there at the same time. And they were leaving at the same time after a couple of weeks. And they're in the airport at Port-au-Prince. And this woman, it turns out, was like four foot ten, ten and Tim is like this. And they're standing in line and this airport is chaos. People are like jumping on counters. Uh, people are screaming. Uh, Haitians want to get out of there because they're afraid they're going to be killed by Papa Doc because they opposed him. So this woman says, they're standing in line, and this guy just walks in front of them in this long line. He just butts in line. And she said that Tim um, reached into his pocket, came out with a switchblade, flicked it, and held the flat end of the blade to this guy's face and said, which ear would you like me to cut off? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Which, of course, was... Neither there. So that's Tim's house. Uh, he's got bridge quality pilings. He's got 16 inch floors and walls. And he's got cisterns and he's got solar panels. And uh, he's got a safe room inside, a room with no windows that he made out of cedar. Uh, <clears throat> he went up to, uh, he wanted, he liked the smell of cedar. So he went up to Kentucky and to a, to a farm and he cut down two trees, uh, went back a year later when the trees had aged a little bit, rented a portable sawmill, milled his own lumber, and then brought it back and built this safe room. And it was full of like 
secret compartments with guns and knives and food and stuff. <laughs> He's one of a kind. So in the summer of 2018, I think it was, uh, Hurricane, was it Irma? Went through the Keys. It was a much more, well, here we just got a tropical storm. In South Florida, in the Keys, it was a Category 4, a big one. It was a scary hurricane. <clears throat> so as luck would have it, he was in Wales at the time on vacation with his wife. And he texted me just wondering if I had heard anything about what happened in the Keys and his house and whatever. So uh, I sent a message to the Miami Herald because I knew the Herald would have photographers down there. And I gave the photographer Tim's address and went to the house. And it was like nothing had happened. It's, it was devastation everywhere. I've just I've seen he he later sent me when he got back some photos and places landmarks for me were just gone. It was just awful. But this house uh, survived. Uh, and there's Carl on the right. And there's Joe Wasilewski. You know the guy who was holding that snake. And then me. And there's Tim. And that was at the Tim had a a showing at the Miami uh, uh, History Museum that we all went to. And it was just a, it was a great time. So anyway, those are, I've told you about three Florida men, and one, or two Florida men and one Florida woman that I think are amazing. And they're the ones who are worth talking about, not the, uh, not the person stealing lobster from <laughs> it. Anyway, does anybody have any questions before we say goodbye. I'm going to be in the uh, I'm going to be in that room across the way. Um, come on over and say hello. You don't have to buy a book, uh, although my feelings will be hurt. But, <laughs> but just come by and say hello. Thank you for having me.